have enjoyed being with you these last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, we want to thank you for your kind hospitality uh, of, of welcoming us here. I had long heard about Pineland Baptist Church through uh, friends Steve Forsey and Nathan Clausen, and uh, now I've seen with my own eyes uh, what everything they told me was true. This is a wonderful group of, of uh, believers, and uh, we, we are delighted to be able to make the acquaintance that we have over these past weeks. And as I told one brother this morning, uh, I have great um, uh, hopes for your future. I think there's every reason for you to be excited and to be in, uh, in anticipation of the good things God is going to do. Because he always blesses his people, doesn't he? And anytime we're trusting in him and relying upon him, we can be sure that the good shepherd is going to take care of his sheep. And we know that to be true. Um, I'm just going to see if I'm still on the air. I am, aren't I? Okay, that's good. That's a good sign. Sometimes you feel led to do some things. Have you had that experience that the Lord just says, uh, you know, I want you to do something today. And I feel led to do something today that I didn't plan on doing when I took out to, to get here. I'm going to share a song with you that is like a testimony song for my life. And uh, I didn't write it. I've written some songs, but I didn't write this song. But I think if I were to pick out one song that is an expression of what I want to be true of me, uh, this is the song that I would choose. So uh, they usually say preachers shouldn't sing and singers shouldn't preach, but I'm going to do both today. And I'm going to slip over here to the piano and just share this song with you that uh, has, has been a blessing to me, and I, I hope it might be to you. It's called Daystar. Lily of the valley, let your sweet aroma fill my life. Rose of Sharon, show me how to live in beauty in God's sight. Fairest of 10,000, make me a reflection of your light. Day star shine down on me, let your love shine through me in the night. Lead me, Lord, I'll follow Anywhere you open up the door Let me know your wisdom Show me things I've never seen before Lord, I want to be your witness You can take what's wrong and make it right Day star shine down on me, let your love shine through me in the night. Lord, I see a world that's dying, blinded by the master of deceit. Groping in the darkness, haunted by the years of past defeat. But then I see you standing near me, shining with compassion in your eyes. Jesus, shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Lead me, Lord, I'll follow anywhere you open up the door. Let me know your wisdom. Show me things I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be your witness. You can take what's wrong and make it right. Day star shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Jesus shine down on me. 
Let your love shine through me in the night. Amen. Well, thank you. Well, I truly mean that that is what I want my life to be about. And I hope you would say the same. You want Jesus to fill your life and to use you wherever he chooses. And I know as I look on your faces today, I'm looking at many of you who have known the Lord for a good long period of time. Uh, some may be newer believers, but I think most of us have known the Lord. And uh, over the course of our life, we have seen his hand working in us and probably the most important thing that will ever happen in our lifetime is for Jesus to actually live out his life in us and work his, his works through us so that he might be glorified. That's what our life is all about. And if you're here this morning and you know Jesus, you know that that's the most important thing is to have Jesus in your heart and life living in you and working through you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to know Jesus, that is the most important thing that you will ever discover. And if you haven't yet come to know him in a personal way with a true relationship to him, this may be the very day that Jesus would be calling you to come into a fellowship, a relationship with him, and, and calling you to, to humble your heart in his presence and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Well, we've been talking over these last several weeks. If you've been here, I've been here over the last uh, three weeks now, this fourth Sunday with you, talking about a new kind of relationship that is possible to have with Jesus, with the Father, and this morning, as we'll talk about, with the Holy Spirit. It comes out of John 14, 15, and 16, which is Jesus' farewell address to his disciples because he told his disciples, and we see it first in chapter 13, that he was going to be going away. And they were upset by that, they were distressed by it, but Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. I have something to tell you about the relationship with me that is going to follow my leaving. So he was preparing them for his departure and this new kind of relationship. And that relationship is a change from his being with them to his being in them. And that's the relationship that Jesus will have with all of his disciples from the time of his resurrection and ascension until he comes again. He is with us, but he is more importantly in us and his spirit indwells us. Now we remember that Jesus in this entire passage, 14, 15, and 16 is using figurative language. We read that in chapter 16 and verse 25. And that's why his disciples had to understand when he talked about the Father's house and when he talked about the vine and the branches. And as we'll see today, when he talked about the helper, he was using figures of speech. We might say metaphors or spiritual uh, metaphorical language so that he could explain to them something that they didn't yet understand. So when we look at these sections of scripture, we need to understand that the metaphors Jesus is using is helping them to know what it means to have his life in them as compared to his life with them as it had been to that point. So the relationship that Jesus is talking about is a relationship to himself, but also to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful truth that is very difficult to get, get our minds around or comprehend or even to explain. But it is true that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Remember the, the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it is called, uh, to the Hebrew scholars, it is called the Shema. It's because that first word, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And we believe in one God. Is that right? 
We do. We believe that God is one. We are not a polytheistic uh, group of believers or someone who believes in many gods. Some people accuse Christians of believing in three gods, but we have one God and we believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. They are indivisible. You cannot separate them one from the other. They are, are, they are so linked together because God is one. I think some of my friends that I have uh, have spent a lot of time in their theology trying to divide the Godhead. The Father is over here and he does this and Jesus is over here and he does this and the Holy Spirit is here and he does this. And I recognize there are aspects of God's work in the world that are attributed to the Father and some to the Son and the, the Spirit. But whenever Jesus is, is present, whenever the Father is present, whenever the Spirit is present, you have all three members of the Godhead. God does not operate separate from himself. And we'll see that today as we get into this scripture. But many people are unclear about their relationship to the Holy Spirit or about who the Holy Spirit is. To them, to some people, the Holy Spirit is a kind of a mysterious other. You see, I recognize God the Father, and I know who Jesus the Son is. I read about him in the Gospels, but I'm not really sure I understand the Holy Spirit. When I was growing up, and many of you have had this experience, we used the King James Version of the Bible, great words of the King James language. But in the King James, uh, you know, we, we have this understanding that um, when you read about the Holy Spirit, it says the Holy, what? The Holy Ghost. Well, what is a ghost? Well, to most of us, we, we think about them on Halloween and other times. It's, a, it's this mysterious uh, spirit that is, is around. Well, the Spirit of God is real and is true, but we don't have to see the Holy Spirit as some mysterious being. Some people have even used this phrase, the Holy Spirit is the most neglected member of the Trinity. Have you heard that before? That the Holy Spirit is the most neglected member of the Trinity? I thought, well, um, hmm, if God is one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, if you're talking to one, how can you neglect the other one? Because they are all uh, interconnected and, uh, and united together. So we do not need to, to worry or to wonder about the Spirit, that he is some mysterious other or he's the most neglected, but he is, he is basically part of, of what Jesus told us would take place after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. And he wanted his disciples, both past and present, to know and recognize the Spirit for who he is and what to expect in relationship to him. Now you notice in this passage, we read from chapter 14 and into chapter 15 and 16, Jesus refers to who, the, the, the person that he calls the helper. And we should know from what Jesus said in John 16, 25, that the helper is a, uh, is a figure of speech that is pointing to uh, uh, someone that you would say more specifically was the Holy Spirit or is the Holy Spirit. He's called the helper because of what he does and his role. Uh, the, the Hebrew, uh, not the Hebrew, but the Greek word many of you recognize with parakletos or paraclete is a word for someone who would be called alongside. It's a compound word. Para for alongside, kaleo for call. So the, the helper is someone who comes to your side. He is uh, someone that you would consider you, you to be your counselor, or the King James word again is comforter, or some other versions use the word advocate. It's used all throughout the scripture, particularly, well, in, in the Gospel of John, it's used these four times, and it's also used in 1 John chapter two, that Jesus himself is called the helper or the advocate. Do you recognize 1 John chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2 where uh, John says, I've written, to these, I've written these things to you so that you don't sin, but if any of you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, meaning Jesus Christ the righteous. 
So Jesus Christ himself is called the helper or the advocate. And you can almost hear in that word some legal terminology or implications, like we would say a lawyer or a counselor or a defender or someone who would be there to plead your case. That's what Jesus has in mind when he uses this word parakletos or paraclete. He's using it of the Holy Spirit. Now I have some, about four questions I want us to look at today to help us understand the nature and the person of the Holy Spirit. Let's begin with this question. What is spirit? Well, in the Bible, there are some words for spirit. In the Old Testament is the Hebrew word ruach, which means spirit or wind. And in the New Testament is the word pneumas, which means the, the exact same thing. It's interesting that in John chapter three, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he was talking to him about being born of the spirit, pneumas, and he said the wind blows wherever it wants to. And the word he uses for wind is pneumas. So wind and spirit are basically the same thing. What do you think of when you see or when you talk about the wind? What's one primary thing that stands out about the wind? It's invisible, you can't see it, that's what Jesus meant. The wind blows wherever it wants to, you can see the effects of it, but you cannot see it. Spirits are invisible. John chapter four, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God in his divine life is a spirit being. No one has ever seen God with the, the physical eyes. When Jesus came into this world as the incarnate son of God, you could see God because he was God visible among us. But the reason you could see him was because Jesus was in a human body. He was the God man here in the flesh. But the word for spirit is breath or wind and spirit is equal to life. If you recognize the nature of yourself, you know that you are made up of two specific parts. You have a physical part of you and you have a non-physical or an immaterial part of you. The physical part of who you are is your body. You are equipped to live in a physical world by having a physical body. But you also possess a spirit. There is breath in you which is your spirit. Some people think that the real you is your spirit and your body is just kind of like a shell that you walk around in. It bothers me when people talk about their body in a negative way saying, oh, this, this old thing, you know, I just can't get, I can't wait to get rid of it so that I can be free to soar and to be with God. Well, you would make a good Greek uh, philosopher because that's what the Greeks believed that the body was bad and the spirit was good, and as soon as you could get out of this body, the better. But do you know God wants you to be in a body because he made you in a body. The human being is a combination of body and spirit. We go back to Genesis 2, 2 and verse 7, it says, and the Lord God formed the man, Adam, out of the dust of the earth. Adama is the Hebrew word for earth. Adam, Adama. We're, we're made out of dirt. <laughs> and he said, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man, that human being, became a living soul. You have a body, and you have a spirit, and you are a soul, because the combination of your body and your spirit makes you a human person. God doesn't have a physical body. He is spirit, but he exists as a divine being. You exist as a human being because you have a spirit and a body and that unity of the two constitutes your humanity. So spirit is breath, but spirit is also life. And when you talk about the spirit in your body, you're talking about your life uh, energy in, within you. When you talk about God who is spirit, you're talking about the divine life of God. But who is the Holy Spirit? Here's another question. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God, the divine life of God, 
The Holy Spirit is God himself. And you see that all throughout Scripture. Whenever you see the teaching about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has personality. Acts chapter 5, you remember Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about what they were giving. What did Peter say to them? He said, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. Why, why did they lie to, to God? Well, they lied to the Spirit of God who was present among them and in them, and uh, they, of course, were accountable for that and paid with their lives for that. But the Holy Spirit is defined there as God. And you cannot separate the Holy Spirit from God. Wherever the Spirit is, God is. Wherever God is, His Spirit is, because the Spirit is God's life. Here's a good definition that I believe is, is true for the Spirit. Now, now, you'll have to take my word for it, but try it on for size and compare it to the Scriptures and see if it doesn't fit. I believe the Holy Spirit is the living, active presence of God. The living, active presence of God. So wherever we read about the Spirit in Scripture, you know that God is present. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when God created the heavens and the earth. What does it say? The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. What does that mean? God was present at creation. He was there active creating the heavens and the earth. When you see Jesus at his baptism, and he comes up out of the water and the heavens opened and, and uh, the Spirit of God descended as a dove and the voice called from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What was going on there? It was the living, active presence of God. God the Father was saying about Jesus the Son, he is my beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a physical form like the dove as a way of showing God's empower or Jesus' empowerment with God's Spirit. And we see it at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given as Jesus promised, even in this passage we read this morning, that he would send that comforter, that helper. And he did on the day of Pentecost. And what happened was there was a sound of a mighty rushing, what? Wind. Why was there wind? Well, because the Spirit was present in power. And we see that there were tongues of fire that came upon each of those who were gathered in that upper room. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see that the Spirit is always present when there's an action of God. The Trinity is one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some people have this idea about the indwelling presence of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit is like a proxy. Have you ever heard that term? He is the proxy to Jesus. Maybe you've cast a proxy vote sometime in the past, and you ask somebody to act on your behalf. You say, I'm not going to be there. Please vote for me. And some people have described the Holy Spirit in that way. He is a proxy for the Father and the Son. My friends, I tell you sincerely, the Holy Spirit is not a proxy. He is the real thing. He is the living, active presence of God. If the Holy Spirit is in your life today, the Father is in your life today. If the Holy Spirit is in your life, the Son of God, Jesus himself, is in your life today. You cannot separate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was making this clear. All members of the Godhead are present. He said in chapter 14 and verse 17, he said, you know him because he has been with you and he will be in you. Who had been with them all this time? Jesus had been with them all this time. Who was in Jesus all that time? <laughs> the Father was in Jesus all that time. The Spirit was in Jesus all that time. So when Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit, he was speaking of the living, active presence of God, the fullness of God that was going to come and live in them as their resident helper. God's presence would be with them, not in the distance somewhere, so that when you called out to him, say, please help me, then he'd have to come running, like calling the paramedics when you fall down. I've fallen and I can't get up. 
Who's going to help you? Well, if you have somebody right alongside of you, they're the ones that's going to help you. That's the Holy Spirit. He is your resident helper, a very present help in your time of trouble because he lives in you. Now, here's another question. How can the Spirit of God be or live in a human being? That's a very good question. Human beings are not God. I know there are some people that believe that. They believe that God created us and we are all gods. The New, new Agers particularly are, are famous for this. You are God and you can do anything if you just believe that you are God. Doesn't the Bible say that uh, we are God? Well, we are not God. We are created by God. We have God's image in us, but God is not e equated with us in that we are him or he is not us, but God's spirit can uh, live within us. The problem is God's spirit cannot live in sinful flesh. Do you agree with that? God's spirit cannot inhabit sinful flesh. God is separate from sin and darkness, so he can't make his home in sinful people. But Jesus came into this world as the God-man, bringing deity and humanity together in one, so that those who are cleansed by his blood, those who are washed in his, in his sacrifice and in the precious blood that he shed, those who are forgiven of their sins because of his payment for their sin can be cleansed and can have a relationship with God. In Jesus, divine life and human life are met in one person. Jesus lived upon this earth in a physical body which was just as physical as your body and mine. He walked on the earth as we walk on this earth. He was absolutely human in every way except he was not sinful. And we read that very clearly in scripture. He was the only one qualified to be the spotless lamb, but he was one of us. And when he died on the cross, he died as a human being, as one of us, so that he might bring us to God. Now, was he only a human being? No, he was God in the flesh. So he was unique, and there never was anyone like him. There will never be anyone quite like him, the God-man, 100% deity, 100% humanity. He brings deity and humanity together. So when you are united to Jesus by faith, you can be united to God the Father and God the Spirit. You have the possibility and the reality of having the divine life of God living inside of you. You are not God himself, but you are one with God if Jesus has come into your life and you are united to him. Another question is, how does the Spirit come to live in a person? How does that happen? Well, we know that Jesus said, and we read about it in these verses, that he said if he would go away, he would send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would be a gift to us. That is, he would be given to us as God's gift from the Father and the Son. The Father gave the Spirit to the Son in order that he might have authority to give the Holy Spirit to all those who believe on him. You remember when Peter preached that wonderful sermon on the day of Pentecost? We read about it in Acts 30, or Acts 2, and verses 32 and 33. And Peter says that uh, this Jesus, God raised up, here it is on the screen, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. On the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit as the gift that Jesus promised would come. The promise of the Spirit that would live and abide in them forever. And Jesus said it himself, I will ask the Father and he will give you uh, the, the, another helper, chapter 14 and verse 15, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. 
The Holy Spirit comes to live in a person as the gift of God. And we read in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is God's life. And here's a wonderful verse we often use when we're testifying to people, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. What's the rest of it? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Holy Spirit is the life of God. He is the eternal life of God. And those who have been redeemed and forgiven of their sins do not pay the penalty for sin, which is death, but are given the gift of eternal life, which is found in the Spirit of God. So this is the reality of the indwelling presence. The Holy Spirit comes as the gift that comes to us when we receive Christ into our lives. Here's an interesting verse in John chapter 20 and verse 22. This is after Jesus had been resurrected and he was still on the earth ministering for those 40 days before he ascended into heaven. You remember that unusual time when Jesus in the upper room met with his disciples. John 20, 22 says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That sounds a little strange. What did he do? Just kind of, yeah, probably. Why, why would he do such a thing as that? Because he was symbolizing, showing them ahead that the Spirit of God, who is the breath of God, is going to actually be in them. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit at that moment because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He had not yet ascended to the Father. But when he did ascend to the Father, as, Paul, as Peter said in his message on the day of Pentecost, he received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, and he sent the Spirit as he said he would into this world. And the Spirit of God indwelt all of those believers gathered on that day, and every believer since that day who has trusted in Jesus as their Savior. This same John who wrote the, the epistles of John, John 1, 2, and 3, said these words, By this we know that we live in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. We know that God lives in us when we know his Spirit lives in us. He also said, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. That's the reality, my friends. The Spirit of God is the very life of God, the eternal life of God. And the Spirit is given to everyone who believes in Jesus, who is united to him by faith. So if you're here this morning and that describes you, you have trusted in Christ and you have been united to him by your belief and your faith in him, you have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You just need to believe that the promise of Jesus is real. And we read also in John that he who has the Son of God has life. Isn't that a wonderful verse? When you have the Son of God in your heart and in your life, his presence in you is the eternal life of God. Jesus said in John 10, verse 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and I give to them eternal life. And Jesus' promise of eternal life is found in the gift of his spirit. I said to you last week, and I'll say it again, eternal life is not dying and going to heaven. It involves going to heaven <laughs> and living with him. But I believe even heaven is not our final, uh, final objective because there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And one day your body and mine, if you're a believer in Christ, is going to be raised to life again. That was the great hope of the Apostle Paul. The resurrection of the body, not just to be free from this body, but to have your body re resurrected like the glorious resurrected body of Jesus and reunited with your spirit to live in a new heaven and a new earth. You, if you think heaven is going to be boring, my friends, you have it all wrong. Heaven will be the most exciting experience you have ever had. You're not going to be sitting disembodied on some cloud playing on some uh, invisible harp. 
You are going to be living in a new heaven and a new earth in glorified bodies, working and serving and enjoying all of the, the greatness of, of a new creation. My, I couldn't, I couldn't begin to even describe what we have to look forward to. But it's because we have eternal life within us. And if you have Jesus in your life, you have eternal life now, presently, because the life of God's Spirit lives in you today. What a glorious truth that is. We need to remind ourselves continually, and I, I realize the things we've been talking about these last few weeks are, are not new news to, uh, to most of you. You have read these chapters before, and you've studied them, and you've heard about the Father's house and the vine and the branches and the helper, the comforter. So this is not new information. But what ought to be new in our lives and ought to be fresh is a daily recognition that when you arise in the morning, you rise as one who has been made alive and who has the life of God in you. And you live your life through the course of the day with the presence of God's Spirit in your life to, to give you guidance, as he said, the Holy Spirit would guide you into all truth. To give you power, as Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. To give you wisdom, he is the one who opens your eyes to all that Jesus taught and brings that to our remembrance. You have the presence of God in you. You are not God himself, but God is in you. And so you can live your life in that way. And if we would just keep that as a reminder in our hearts daily, continually, we would find God's work in us would be more uh, present and more real and more, we would be more aware of the fact that Jesus is right here with me. When I pray, I don't have to wing my prayers way out in the distance somewhere. Jesus is right here with me. The Father is here with me. The Spirit is here with me. When I need his help and his guidance, I don't have to somehow wonder where it's coming from. It's right here in me. If I will just tap into the reality of that. My friends, let's, let's be reminded and refreshed of the fact that when you have the Son of God Jesus, you have life, you have the Father, you have the Son living within you. Now I would say that if there is anyone here who does not know what that reality is, I would, I would plead with you today, open your heart to Jesus because he is the only way to life. If you don't have Jesus in your life, all you have to look forward to is an eternity of darkness and despair and punishment. There is such a place as hell. There is such a destiny as being damned and perishing. Jesus said, God loved the world in this way that he sent his son into the world so that you would not perish, but have everlasting life. You don't have to die and go to hell and pay for your own sins because Jesus died and paid for your sins. And if you will believe that and trust in him today, he will give you eternal life and the gift of his spirit. Oh, what good news that is. That's the best news that you could hear today. And for us who know Jesus, let's be reminded of the good news that you have his life living in you. Let's pray together. How grateful we are, Father, for your clear word to us today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world, to being willing to be one of us, to take upon the form of humanity and to identify with us so intimately. And we thank you that you are God, and we thank you that you have brought us to the Father. Thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life and you can bring us into the very presence of God the Father. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. You've kept your promise. You said you would send the Spirit, and you did. And now we who know you can experience that reality. I pray for anyone here today without your Spirit in them. Convict them, Lord, as you said, the Spirit would bring conviction of sin. May they understand that there is no hope for their life ahead. If they were to die today and not know you, that there would be no hope for their future. But 
with you they would have the gift of eternal life. Bring them to a place of repentance and understanding, I pray. And may that, this be a day of salvation for some. Now, Lord, we just want to thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that you are the God who is and the God who always will be. And we take our place as those who are united to you in faith. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, we pray. And God's people say together, amen and amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. God bless you today.